Okay, um, I heard a story about a man who went on holiday to the Holy Land and he took his he took his wife and he took his mother-in-law with him and they had a great holiday they were in Israel they were doing all the all the tours and everything and they had a great time but his mother-in-law got sick took a turn for the worse and then she died and the man wasn't sure what to do he's like oh no you know what do you do we have got, we're, we're abroad and my mother-in-law's died so he went to see a local undertaker and he said look what can I do and the undertaker said well you've got two choices so your first choice, you can, you can fly your mother-in-law home on a plane and then you can bury her back in England and, you know, and, and, all, and all that, and that's fine. He said, but that's expensive. It's going to cost you about £10,000 to do that. He said, alternatively, if you want, obviously it's your mother-in-law, you can bury her here in the Holy Land and you know, we'll do that, we'll do it for 150 quid." And the man thinks for a moment, he says, no, 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 I'll... I'll take her home. I'll fly her home. And the undertaker says, wow, he said, you must really love your mother-in-law to want her there with you in England. Uh, and the man says, well, I, I read an account of a guy who died and then he rose again after three days and I just don't want to take that chance. <laughs> Thank you. Now, was that good? Was that a good one? Was that one of the better ones? Uh, Happy Easter! They don't get any better than that, you know. My name's Adam. I'm one of the leaders here. Uh, if you're here for the first time, welcome. I hope that you just in kind of relax and enjoy yourself. I'm going to be speaking probably for about half an hour or so, uh, just giving us the message of the good news that Jesus has risen. Um, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen the, the movie Schindler's List. A bit of a, suddenly take a dark turn right there, right? I just, whoo, Schindler's List. Uh, you see, I've got my... I've got my mug here, which says Oscar Schindler's Enamel Factory on it. Um, uh, and I'll, there's a reason why. Anyway, this, this, the film Schindler's List, if you haven't seen it, it's a great film. It's very moving, and it tells a story of a German industrialist, a guy called Oscar Schindler, during the Second World War. He takes over an, an enamel factory in Krakow in Poland. And he begins to employ Jews in his factory, in his operation. And he takes Jews from the ghetto and he takes them from Auschwitz camp, which is nearby. And he gives them work in his factory, essentially saving their lives. So essentially Schindler's list, his list, is a literal list of Jews, about 1,200 Jews who he employed, who became essential to the war effort as far as Germany was concerned. And so he saved their lives. Uh, save them from the death camps. Um, it's a true story and it's an amazing story of redemption and hope. And in 2012 they counted the descendants from the Schindler Jews who were alive at the time and there were 8,500 then alive because of what Oscar Schindler had done. Why am I telling you uh, about this film Schindler's List? Well, three reasons. The first reason I'm telling you is because it's a movie and I like to talk about movies. I love movies, I love watching movies. The second reason is, is a couple of weeks ago, I had the privilege to go to Krakow with, uh, in Poland with my brother, and we visited Schindler's factory, we visited all the other places, and it's, the factory is an amazing memorial telling the story of the, uh, kind of, particularly the Jewish experiences in Krakow during the Second World War. And the third reason I'm telling you this is because it's an account of a man who brought freedom to a group of people who were destined for death. And that just seems appropriate for Easter Sunday, right? Because yeah. it's Easter Sunday. In the past few weeks we've been in a series, I think eight weeks we've been in this series, uh, Freedom, uh, trying to kind of work out the life that we want, the life that God's got for us, looking at what that means for us. And I've got to say, the trip that I made to Poland, to Krakow, visiting Schindler's factory, walking around Auschwitz, walking around Birkenau, having a tour around the Jewish ghetto, uh, going to various museums and memorials, it really kind of put into stark light this idea of freedom. It was, a, it was such a, an interesting time to go when we've been talking about freedom. There's a guy um, who was in the concentration camp at Auschwitz. You may have heard of him. It's, a, it's a, a psychologist and author, a guy called Viktor Frankl. And he was an inmate there, and he realized that survival in these camps and in prison in general um, depended on having an inner circumstance rather than and out of circle. Obviously, you know, the Germans were barbaric and cruel and, and killing people, but he said those who kind of got their inner self in a good place were able to kind of more readily survive than those who didn't. 
He said, if you hold on to hope, if you hold on to purpose, you can experience freedom on the inside. Um, And this is what he wrote in his book. He wrote this. He said, we who lived in concentration camps can remember the men who walked through the huts, comforting others, giving away their last piece of bread. They may have been few in number, but they offer sufficient proof that everything can be taken from a man. But one thing, the last of the human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any given circumstance, to choose one's own way. And this is why, obviously it's, it's quite a human approach to this thought of hope and purpose. But actually, if we look through the Bible, we see this through the Bible as well. It's why Paul can write his letters, the Apostle Paul can write his letters from prison filled with joy. Like some of those letters are the most joyous and hope-filled and happy kind of letters uh, that we see. Read his letter to the, Phil- to the Philippian church. It is so uplifting. And he's writing it from prison close to death. Um, and he talks about freedom, being free in Christ, being content. He doesn't allow his external circumstance to deprive him of his life, of his joy, or of his freedom. You see, I think we often, and and me as well, I'm including myself in this, we often view freedom as an external matter. And we say, God, please change my circumstances. Please change this situation that I'm in. You can see I've got this coming against me. This thing's happened to me this week. Please change it so I can be free of it. But really, and I hope you've picked this up over the last few weeks, God is most interested in us having freedom inside because that lasts if we rely on having better circumstances then our our kind of our hope and our joy and our peace will depend on other things whereas if we can take on this idea that we can be free on the inside whatever's going on on the outside I can have peace on the inside I can have joy on the inside I can have hope on the inside then no matter what's facing me because trouble will come Yeah, you're all nodding at that. Trouble comes. But we can not just survive, we can thrive in it because of what we've got in us. And God is most interested in giving us internal freedom. This is what Paul wrote uh, from prison. I know what it is to be in need. Maybe you know that too. I know what it is to have stuff come against me. I know what it is to have people saying bad things against me. I know what it is to have people attacking me. I know what it is to face circumstances that are not of my own doing, but they just happen. And I know what it is to have plenty. And I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. I would love it if we could get to that point. Imagine that as a church. We could truthfully say, I have learned the secret of being content whatever's happening to me. Whatever the circumstances, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or living in want. And how? What's the secret? Well, then he gives us the secret. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Through Christ, in Christ, it's God in us. That's where my strength comes from. That's where my freedom comes from. And it seems to me that that is true freedom, right? That is true freedom. Inner freedom. So our key verse for this entire series has spoken into this. Uh, Our key verse from Galatians, uh, again another Paul letter. He said, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Okay? That's where we get our freedom from. It's from Christ. So, and it's for freedom. It's so that we can live a free life that Christ has set us free. So then he says, stand firm then. Stand firm then. Like, set your face like, and decide that that's how you're going to do it. And do not let yourself be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Don't keep going back to the old things. Don't keep going back to the way that you've already put aside. There's a gap between this, the life of freedom, this unbreakable, internal, spiritual freedom that God has got for us. And sometimes there's a gap between that and the way we actually live. Now, it's possible. It is possible that you've got it all together. All right, maybe I'm preaching to me today. It may be that you've got it all together. You're listening to your, you're the choir. You've got, you know all the, you know all the words. This, you've got this. And, and if that's you, if you like, if you have no relationship issues, if you have no sense of struggling with fear or anxiety or, you know, anything like that, maybe your life is just, is just 
uh, cushy and perfect and you're living in total freedom. If that's you, then I give you permission to close your eyes and dream about burgers that we're going to eat shortly. All right? But for the rest of us who are on a journey, for the rest of us who haven't quite made it, we're going to unpack some truths today. We're going to focus on the empty tomb. We're going to focus on the empty tomb today because the empty tomb is such a great symbol. It's where the power of freedom lies. And there are three little words. We all know the three little words that we all like to hear. Three well-known little words, which I'll give you at the end. It's my favorite three words, and maybe it's your favorite three words as well. So it's early on the first Easter Sunday morning, okay? We're going to do a bit of a, a mind thing there. We're going to do a bit of imagination. It's early on the first Easter Sunday morning. The sun is just coming over the horizon, and I want you to imagine that you are there in front of this big rock face with this tomb cut out. The stone is in place, but there's guards there in front of the stone, and you're there, and you're watching, watching this, okay? The sun comes up. And then suddenly, as you're watching, an angel comes down. This is what the Gospels tell us. An angel comes down and pushes the stone away. Now, the guards are there. The, uh, the story tell, the account tells us that they guards kind of, they get petrified. They kind of stand there and they're like standing still. They can't do anything about it, all right? They're kind of frozen as if dead, I think it says. Um, but you see the stone move away. And so now you're sat there and you're looking into the, into the tomb, looking at the stone being moved. My question is, what are you looking at? What do you think you see in that moment? Maybe you think you see the stone pushed away and kind of Jesus kind of come out, squint a bit because of the light, have a stretch, say thank you to the angel for letting him out and just walk off stage left. Maybe that's what you think you see. That's not what you see, by the way, okay? What you see is an empty tomb. Jesus is not there. Jesus has gone already. He's been doing what he needs to do. He's been at work on, on your behalf already. He's been defeating sin and death. He's been getting victory so we can have freedom. The tomb is empty, which is why I love the symbol of the empty tomb. I know as Christians, we kind of use the symbol of the cross a lot. You know, we have earrings or a kind of chain around our neck, maybe pictures. But the empty tomb... If you could wear that as an earring, I would wear that. If I could get a t-shirt, that, that's just amazing. Right? The empty tomb is such a symbol of freedom for us. This empty space with the stone at the side. So if the, tomb is, if the tomb is empty, why the need to open the tomb at all? Why do we need to open it? If, the, if he's not in there, why do we need to open it? Well, it's for you. And for me, it's so that we can look inside. It's for all those witnesses who look inside and see that, yes, Jesus died, but now he's risen and he's not there anymore. It's for us to see and believe, to realize and to take it and to trust that he is alive. He has rose again. And this image of the empty tomb is, is a promise of freedom. It's a promise given by God to us that from now on, not only are we free from the power of sin, not only are we free from the grip of death, we are free to enjoy a relationship with our Father God, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. We are free to worship our God forever and ever. We are free to experience eternal life. And we're free to experience life in all of its fullness now, in every circumstance we face. Because Jesus' primary purpose to come to the earth, we looked at this last week, if you remember, in the message last week, we saw that when he, his first message that he gave, he said, the Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to bring freedom to the prisoners. That was his anointing. That was his purpose. And then here, at the end, we see that He's done it, and the empty tomb tells us and shows us that he's done it. So I want to say something this morning, and I want you to take this on board, that Jesus died and has risen to free us from prison. Jesus died 
and has risen to free us from prison. Let's all say that. Jesus died and has risen to free us from prison. And it rhymes so you can remember it. So when you're facing whatever circumstance comes against you and you're tempted to get angry or to get bitter or to kind of just go in a funk or to just kind of lose it, you say to yourself, Jesus died and has risen to save me from prison. I don't need to go that way. I don't need to take that path. On the cross, after all the beatings and the whippings and the jeering and the laughing and the stripping and the crown of thoughts and the ridiculing and the pain and the nailing and the humiliation and, and just before the death, Jesus said this. He said, Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. For they don't know what they're doing. Father, forgive them. Because Jesus died and has risen to free us from the prison of unforgiveness. Amen. Because that's a prison. Yeah. Unforgiveness. If somebody has hurt you, and I'm sure there are people today, here, right now, who you know that somebody has hurt you, somebody has offended you, and you've held on to this. And we know what that looks like. You hold on to the hurt and, and it becomes, it festers inside you and it kind of puts bars around your life. It stops you living life in all of its fullness. It becomes a prison. It leads to bitterness and resentment and creates a prison. But Jesus died and has risen to free you from the prison of unforgiveness. Father, forgive them. Those were his words. There was a lady in Auschwitz and she arrived at Auschwitz. She was, her name is Eva Kaur. She arrived in Auschwitz as a 10-year-old child with her twin sister and her mother. And the fact that she was a twin saved her life because immediately she and her twin were sent off to be experimented on. She never saw her mother or any of her family again. And she knew she had to stay alive for the sake of her sister because if she died, then... They've no reason to keep her sister alive. And she endured years of ridiculous, ridiculous giving her illnesses and diseases and experimentation, and all sorts of terrible things. At the end of the war, she realized she was freed from her external prison. She was released from Auschwitz. But she soon realized that she would be held in an internal prison unless she was able to forgive kind of the Germans, the captors, the SS officers, the medical, the doctors, the medical people, unless she was able to forgive them, she thought, I'm going to be held in this internal prison forever. And that's what she did. And she did it publicly. And she did it without reservation. And she set up an organization where she traveled the world speaking about her experiences and talking about forgiveness. This is actually what she said. My forgiveness has nothing to do with the perpetrators. It is my act of self-liberation. I had no power over my life up to the time that I discovered that I could forgive. Jesus died and has risen to free us from the prison of unforgiveness. You don't need to wait for your circumstances to change. You don't need to wait for an apology. You don't need to wait for the person who hurt you to make amends. When you refuse to forgive someone who has hurt you, you are giving them the key to the chains that are around you. Jesus died and has risen to free me from the prison of unforgiveness. Let me give you another statement that Jesus made. This one's in Luke 23. He's on the cross and he said this, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Today... You will be with me in paradise. And I'm sure most of you know who he was talking to. He was directing this at the, the thief who was on the cross next to him. So there were two people, two thieves, who were, who were crucified at the same time as Jesus. One on his left and one on his right. And one of the prisoners just says these words to him. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. That's all he says. Is, Remember me. He doesn't say, I'm sorry for what I've done. He doesn't say, forgive me. He doesn't say, uh, God, you know, uh, I need redemption. He doesn't say, he just says, remember me. And to that, Jesus says to him, today, you will be with me in paradise. 
Jesus died and has risen to free us from the prison of uncertainty. Because we can live with uncertainty, we can live with doubt. And that can create a prison around us. This man was a criminal, and yet salvation was given to him in a moment. The camp at Auschwitz, when we were there, they told us that it has a dual purpose. It was a death camp, it was an extermination camp, but it was also a labor camp where they put those who were fit to work for them. And as you walk into the camp, there is a sign above the gates, and it's this same sign that the Germans used on all these camps. They had the same, the same three words. This is not the three words I'm talking about, by the way. They had the same three words on every gate at their camp. Um, let me just play you. This was a video of me walking into the camp. You can see the three words above the gate here. Arbeit macht frei. I don't know if you speak German. Arbeit macht frei. It literally means, in English, work makes free, or work will make you free. Work sets you free. It's one of the many lies that the Germans, that the Germans said to those going into the camp. And the lie is this, you can earn freedom by your work. And this lie, I think, is relevant to us as well. It's a lie that we can all believe. We can, we can get to, to this place where we think like we have to work to earn our freedom. That we have to work to earn our salvation. We've got to work to earn the joy. We've got to work to earn the hope and the peace. We've got to work to earn the future that God has for us. And it's a lie. The trouble with the lie is this. If my freedom is contingent upon my works, then that leaves me with uncertainty because the question comes, well, have I done enough? Am I good enough? Have I done more good things than bad things? Have I done what I need to do in order to get my freedom, in order to get the salvation, in order to get life? Jesus offers us freedom. He offers us salvation. He offers us hope, not because we've earned it, but because he paid for it. Yes. He paid for it. He died for it. And we, we have to accept it on those terms, on those conditions, in Christ, like the thief did on the cross. Jesus, ride, rose, sorry, Jesus died and has risen to free me from the prison of uncertainty. Another thing Jesus said on the cross was this. He said he saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby. And he said to her, woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. And this is an incredible moment. Jesus is there. And obviously he's in agony. He's in pain. He's close to death. He's short of, he's short of breath. He's been whipped. He's been beaten. He's covered in blood. He's got the thorns on his head. And in that moment, he's thinking of his mother. And he thinks... I need to give my mother security. He's thinking of her future and her security. Because Jesus died and had risen to free us from the prison of insecurity. Now insecurity is rife. We all, we all kind of face that at times. We all become insecure at times, right? We do. And it leads to anxiety. And it leads to fear. A fear that we shouldn't have. We need to be secure. We need to know that we don't get our security from the things of this world because they are transient, they are unreliable. We get our security, our inner security, from our knowledge of what God has done. That God made me, that God loves me, that he's died for me, that he's got a plan for me, that he's got a future for me. And we need to learn to trust his love for us. And experience that freedom of security. And do you know where security comes from? It comes from living out truth. Actual truth. When we live out, when we live in truth, we can feel secure. Jesus said, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. That's where our freedom comes from. And one of the things that struck me on, on my visit to Auschwitz and the camps was the way that the, the Germans, the Nazis... We're able to get 
Hundreds of thousands of people to comply with them, to do what they wanted them to do. It makes no sense. But the way they did it was to just feed them lies. Feed them lies all the time, using lies, using deceit. In one of the museums that we visited, there are all these old photos of, of Jewish families. Um, and these Jewish families are walking, carrying their belongings. They're, maybe they've got a horse or they've got a car, and they're all walking compliantly. And they've been herded out of their own homes, and they've been herded towards a kind of a section of the town that the Germans have, have kind of boarded off for them to live in, the, what we now call the ghetto, the Jewish ghetto. And they're all going, these pictures, they're smiling and they're skipping along because they think they're going to a great place, a place where they can all be together. And it was a lie. The ghetto, it contained 320 houses. We had to walk around it, Dom and I did. We walked around the ghetto. 320 houses to which they herded 16,000 Jews to go and live in this place. And it wasn't the first lie that they're told. They're like, wear this Star of David, wear this armband. Move into the ghetto, it's for your safety. You can all be together. From the ghetto, they move them onto the trains. On these trains, they said, we are moving you to a different place again, where you can be with your people. From the trains, they got onto Auschwitz platform. And they said, oh, we're stopping for a refreshment stop. To clean up after a long journey. On the platform, they separated them into the men who could work, and, and the women and the children, the disabled and the elderly, who couldn't work. They told them to write their names and numbers on, the, on their suitcases. They said, oh, you'll come and get these later. And then they sent them off to have a shower. You know what happened. And at each stage, the tour guide told us that the people who were there, they had doubts in their mind about what was happening, but they complied and they chose to believe the lies they were being fed because the truth was so much harder. And this broke my heart, I guess, more than anything else that I saw, because I recognized it as a disease in society today. People willing to believe a lie because it's easier than believing the truth. And walking headlong to death and destruction, happily, without knowing where they're going. We are fed a feast of lies about what freedom is. The society tells us freedom is doing what I want, whenever I want, with whoever I want, without consequences. And that's just a lie. That doesn't exist. That world doesn't exist. And the media tells us, look at this. Come and do this. Come and get your fix. It's shocking, yes. It's distracting. It will distract you from your life. It'll make you feel better. Look at this. And we've got men addicted to pornography. We've got girls addicted to phones and social media. It's a hard message. But we need to face this. Lies about possessions and wealth. Lies about gender identity. Lies about relationships and family. And each step leading people happily and blindly down a path to enslavement and death. Jesus said, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. This is the freedom that Jesus paid for. Jesus died and has risen to free me from the prison of insecurity. One more statement. We all know this statement. Jesus on the cross, he said, it is finished. It is finished. And this is the biggest statement of all, I guess. It's done. It's accomplished. The thing I came here to do, my purpose, my plans, the, God, the job that God gave me to do, it's done. It's finished. Jesus began his ministry by laying out this, like I've said. He said, the Spirit of the Lord is on me. He has anointed me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners. This is my purpose. And at the end of his life, on the cross, it is finished. I'm done. He breathes his last. The new kingdom is birthed. The new covenant is sealed. And freedom is available to all. Because Jesus has died and has risen to free me from the prison of sin and death. 
Freedom is there, but we need to walk in it and live it out. Now, I've been challenged so much by this freedom series, and I hope you have too. But I've got to tell you, it's, it's, it's broken my heart a number of times, preparing these messages. You know, I've, you've seen me up here, <laughs> sniveling away. It's broken my heart quite a lot. Because, you know, we sing that sometimes, break my heart from what breaks yours, God. I think it's a good thing. And, you know, this trip that I've made with my brother Dom to Poland a couple of weeks ago, seeing the camps where all this took place. On the last day of our trip, we went to, we went to the Birkenau camp where most of the killing kind of took place. The whole week had been pretty grey and, and rainy and cloudy, but this last day was, was sunny, the sun was shining. We were visiting this camp and it was hard. It was really hard. Seeing the kind of the, the sheds where, that were kind of maybe half the size of this hall where 1,200 inmates were kept. Seeing the, and walking through the gas chambers, seeing the place where they burned the bodies, seeing the administration block, seeing the place where they hung and shot prisoners, seeing the place where they kind of put prisoners in cells, where all this took place, it was really hard. Seeing the platform and standing on the train platform where they would separate the people to those who could work and those who couldn't, those who were about to die and those who were about to just face just a hideous few years. As we were leaving, on the last day, it was about six o'clock, the sun was setting, and a group of, a big crowd of people arrived, and, and they were Jews, they were, they'd come, and they stood on the platform, they, and in fact, they separated themselves into, into men and women. And they just stood together, arm in arm, and they started to sing, The sound up. Is there any sound on this? And they were singing. They were singing kind of, an, I guess it was a lament. It was kind of heartbreaking, it was moving. But then we walked out the gates and left. We just left. And Dom and I, we were able to do that. We were able to leave the, the Auschwitz, we were able to get on a bus and go back to the hotel. We were able to leave because we had a ticket to leave. And as we got on the bus, this was our bus ticket, Dom noticed something. And look, three little words. Paid in full. Paid in full. This is why we can live in freedom. Not because we do anything, not because we've got skills, not because we've got any kind of... deserving about for this. We can live in freedom because our freedom has been paid for in full. We've been paid in full. So we can live life in all of its fullness because Jesus paid in full. We can be free from the prison of insecurity because it's been paid in full. From the prison of uncertainty, from the prison of unforgiveness, from the prison of sin and death, from whatever prison you have hold, from the prisons of bitterness, from the prison of, of a lack of joy, from the prison of relationship breakdown, from the prisons of 
people hurting you, from the prison of holding on to that hurt. It's been paid for in full. That's what Easter is about. That's why we look at the empty tomb and it's empty. And we can be joyful because it's empty. Because that gives us, that's the promise of freedom for us. We don't want to waste the fact that it's been paid in full by burdening ourselves through a yoke of slavery again. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Now in a service like this, in a message like this, everything doesn't change. You're still going to go back to the things that you were facing before you came here. There's still things going on in your life. And maybe there's aspects of your life that you're still going to be in prison because it's not dealt with. Because actually, in reality, we're on a journey. It's a journey that we're on. It's not a moment that we're on. It's a journey. And it's probably a journey that we're going to be on forever until, until we face glory and face Jesus in heaven. And then we'll kind of experience true freedom. But we're on this journey. And we know that it's paid in full. And so I guess I want to echo what Fru was encouraging us this series freedom in Christ we're doing it because we're on a journey over the last eight weeks we've been looking at this on a Sunday and talking about freedom and it's great and we can be inspired to deal with some areas but you know what in my life there's deeper things there's stuff that I don't even know about that I need to go into and that's what this is a course that's done all over the world it's a brilliant course and so when Fru is encouraging you to do this course it's not trying to get you to come to small group it's trying to get you to be free it's trying to get you to realize that it's paid in full so I'm just going to take the steps that I need to take to live it because it's been done for me so again I would encourage us put those 10 weeks aside those 10 hour and a half that's all it is maybe that will change everything and maybe we will be able to gather together at the end of that week and celebrate freedom together in fact let's put that in on that Sunday let's do a celebration Sunday after that away day because we're all got that much closer on that journey towards freedom I'm done we're going to sing a song in just a moment but let me just invite Fru to bring us to a close